What I figured out with filigree many years ago is that it is so often done just in a little bit of a dome or mostly kind of flat or maybe bit into a cylinder like for a ring. But most of the forms are very synclastic. They're very hemispherical, they're very rounded, which works beautifully with the very traditional shapes of those kind of comma-like structures that go into the interior of the filigree space. But what I figured out years ago was that it didn't have to be that way, that you could make it ripple, that you could essentially form it like a sheet as long as you took into account that you're working with something that is full of negative spaces. And so if you bend a sheet of silver, however you form it, if it's the same thickness from a physics standpoint, it behaves uniformly. But as soon as you take a sheet that is pierced, that's full of holes on purpose, then the spaces move differently than the solid areas and the spaces splay apart. So if you work that to your advantage, if you pay attention to where things need to be more solid or where things can be more open, then it's very possible to still form that sheet of lace, essentially, the way you want it. The other thing I figured out was particularly where you need things to be small and lightweight and not have a lot of mass, like earrings or other wearable components where there may be actually a lot of metal, but you need to take the weight of it into account and keep it as physically light and airy. There were these places where now you're looking at the front and now you're looking at the back, depending on how you make the filigree twist and turn. Because filigree is always one-sided. There's always a front side and there's always a back side to that open back traditional filigrana structure. And the back is very flush and sometimes maybe not as pretty as the front side where the filler wires sit down inside the frame just a little bit, where they're more protected. And it gives a, it gives a layer of dimensionality to the filigree even when it's flat. I figured if I could get people to do a pendant that was in that structure. And then when they do that, the moment they bend it, all of a sudden they go, oh, I got it. And I say, okay, now, you're going to make a bigger, more complex thing that's going to bend or twist or curve laterally or all of these things. I have everybody do paper models that can have any of the elements that I show people in my more complex structures. It takes at least four or five times of imagining this structure uncurled. But of course, the first time you do it, you're seeing what it looks like flat the paper models become more doable because you try one and you go, oh, that's not going to bend the way I want it to. And then you try another one and you tweak it a little bit and you go, oh, right. This leaf shaped structure over here has to come off at this angle. And then I can make it flip up in this direction at this angle or curl around this way or twist here. And then once that starts to make sense in the paper model, when you flatten it back out, you have a template to create the frame structure. So it's a little bit like the patterns of sheet that you would need for anaclastic raising, like Hecky Saipa used to do. It wouldn't just be a big flat square sheet of metal, but you would cut it out into a particular shape. And then from that shape, you could form these shell-like structures. So in that sense, it, it works a little bit the same way. It's just that you never have the same exact pattern twice. You have to come up with the idea and then make up the pattern every single time for what it's going to be. And the more you do that, the better you get at knowing how these things need to be maybe stretched out a little bit longer to accommodate the curve and, and go around as many times as you want or twist as far or so forth. So that's the big secret.